62-year-old widow, Adeline Smith, lived alone at 47 Westlands Road, Copthorne, Shrewsbury, in the West Midlands of England. She had moved to the area following the death of her husband, a former professor at Bristol University, three years earlier, to be closer to her sister. A keen fundraiser for the local church, she had recently collected a large sum of money and donations, and was a popular member of the congregation and community. On Friday evening, October 7th, 1960, Adeline spoke on the telephone to her sister, Olive Martin, and they arranged to meet up on the following day. Shortly before 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, Olive telephoned her sister and on receiving no reply, called at the house. The curtains were still drawn and there was no answer to her knocking, which alerted a neighbour who came to give assistance. Walking round to the back of the house, he saw a broken pane of glass in some French windows. He let himself in, opened the front door and then let Olive in. Climbing the stairs to the bedroom, Olive shrieked in horror at the sight that greeted her. Adeline's naked and battered body lay on the bedroom floor. She had clearly been brutally attacked. There were bloodstains on the bed and streaks on the wall. And such was the ferocity of her beating, her head lay in a pool of blood and her face was barely recognisable. The investigation was led by Detective Inspector William Brumpton, head of Shrewsbury CID and he noted that death had almost certainly been caused by blows to the head. Detectives were soon able to pin down the probable time of the murder when a next door neighbour told officers she had heard a scream at around two o'clock in the morning. Footprints left near a stile which led from Adeline's garden to some muddy fields showed the killer's probable escape route. Brumpton immediately had a prime suspect. Living directly across the street at number 38 was the Riley family headed by George Riley Sr, a 48-year-old PE teacher and former regimental sergeant major. Riley had four sons, the second youngest being his 21-year-old namesake, well known to the detective as a convicted criminal and something of a local troublemaker. Brumpton crossed the road to the house and found that George Riley Jr was out at work, the only occupant at the time being youngest son 16-year-old David. Brumpton went to George's room and his suspicions that Riley was involved seemed to be justified. Hanging in the wardrobe was Riley's suit, which had some red stains that looked like blood, and the trousers were damp and muddy below the knees. Riley worked as a butcher's apprentice and the detectives went to his workplace at noon to speak to him. Ten minutes later he was in Swan Hill Police Station where he told detectives about his movements on the previous evening. Riley said that on Friday night, his friend Tony Brown had picked him up in a car and they got into town, consuming a large quantity of beer and whiskey at a number of pubs, including the one next door to the police station, the Admiral Bembo. At closing time of the pubs, they made their way over to a dance at the local Rolls-Royce Sentinel factory, where the bar remained open till 12.30. He said he'd become involved in a fight with another man, which led to the police being called. By the time they called it at night, Riley said he had drunk around nine whiskies on top of the beer and that he had never been so drunk in his life. Finally, at about 1.30, Riley was given a lift home. He claimed he went into the shed and fell asleep on an old sofa before waking at around 4.30, by which time his brother Terry was up for work and eating his breakfast in the kitchen. George knocked on the window and said he had forgotten his key and had fallen asleep. Seeing the scratches on his face, Terry had asked if he'd been fighting and who won. Yes, I have, George replied. It was a draw. Riley said he went to bed at 5am, but having to wake at quarter to seven for his Saturday morning shift at the butchers, he hardly slept, and arriving at work, his boss could see he was a worse for wear and poured him a glass of health salts. The claims about the fight were supported when the police spoke to the other person involved, Lawrence Griffiths, and the officer who had broken up the fight, PC Reg Mason. Tellingly, Mason said Riley did not have any scratches on his face when he pulled the two lads apart. Riley was interviewed by Detective Inspector Brumpton and his sergeant for most of the afternoon, and by five to seven that evening had written a confession which as good as signed his own death warrant. The confession George Riley had written left him liable to the death penalty. He was alleged to have claimed that he had gone to Adeline Smith's house to steal her handbag. Thus, if Riley was responsible for her death, 
he would be convicted of capital murder in the course of furtherance of theft and face the gallows. Made in just the presence of Inspector Brompton and Sergeant Phillips, and with no solicitor present, the statement begins when Riley said he awoke on the sofa in the garden shed. I don't know how long I stayed there, but the next thing I recollect, I was in Mrs Smith's house and I was after some money. I had spent more than I meant to that night. I knew she had lots of money and I knew she kept her handbag upstairs because I had been to her for change and she always used to run upstairs for it. I got into the bedroom and was next to her bed and all of a sudden she jumped up and started shouting at me. I then grabbed hold of her by the nightdress and pulled her off the bed. I then towed her in the front. I hit her in the face a couple of times to stop her from shouting because I was very frightened. She continued shouting and grabbing hold of me to stop me running away. I hit her once more and she let go of me and I ran out. She was still shouting as I ran down the stairs. I got out the same way I got in. I didn't take anything at all from the house. I was frightened. I ran over the fields. I didn't know in which direction and I didn't care as long as I got away. After I had been running for about 10 minutes, I stopped and found myself near the grapes inn. I then cut across the fields to my house and went into the shed. I did not mean to hurt Mrs Smith because I know her very well and I only hit her because she jumped up and shouted and frightened me. I am very sorry things ended like this. I did not mean to harm her. I only wanted some money. Signed, George Riley. When Riley's solicitor arrived, he was greeted by Brumpton with the words, No panic, he's croaked. Riley claimed that detectives had told him that he was guilty. They said they had found his footprints in the back garden, that the injuries had been caused by someone punching her in the face, wearing a ring just like he had on his finger, and that his suit was covered in blood. They also said that the scratches and bruises clearly visible on his hands were caused during the attack. Being so intoxicated, Riley claimed he had absolutely no memory of what he had done, and with increased pressure from the detectives to admit he was there, he finally confessed that if they said he was there and they had evidence to support it, then he must have been. Crucially, detectives have got him to state that the reason he had gone to the house was to steal her purse. This was despite her purse being found in the handbag in the bedroom on the following morning. It contained just a few shillings. George Riley retracted the statement, but believing they had enough evidence that he was guilty, he was charged with murder and sent to Liverpool's Walton Jail to await his trial. Brumpton's belief that Riley was the killer dated from December 1957 when he had been charged with wounding with intent to cause grievous bodily harm following a fight on Christmas Eve. Riley, then an army cadet, had been drinking and stabbed two teenagers with a flick knife. He claimed it was in self-defence but in February 1958 he was sentenced to two terms of nine months to run concurrently. Riley's trial was to be heard at Staffordshire Assizes rather than the Shropshire Circuit in Shrewsbury. It was felt that such was a local feeling against the accused it would be hard to get a fair trial. But besides this, Riley's barrister, Edward Riley Richardson QC, was unable to attend the sessions of the Shropshire Assizes which would have followed the Staffordshire sitting. The trial began on Monday the 5th of December 1960 with Mr Justice Berry presiding. Riley pleaded not guilty. Kenneth Minot QC led for the prosecution and began by telling the jury that the only evidence against Riley was his own word. Assisting Ryder Richardson with the defence was Peter Northcourt. By the time the trial began, much of the police evidence had failed to stand up to scrutiny. The red stains on Riley's jacket were in fact polished from the Rolls Royce canteen floor and the few specks of blood on his trousers were too minute to analyse. His shirt and tie also bore no traces of blood. Crime pathologist Dr Gerald Evans said Mrs Smith had been killed by half a dozen punches to the face and the killer was almost certainly wearing a ring. Riley's ring did have specks of blood on it but again it was too minute to examine and with such a brutal and repeated attack the assailant would almost certainly have blood on his clothes. Mrs Smith's bedroom had been sprayed all over with blood. The forensic laboratory could find no traces of blood or skin under Riley's fingernails. There were no fingerprints in the house and a footprint in the garden did not tie up with Riley's. Mrs Smith's handbag, which contained three shillings and eight pence, was found beside the bed. 
In the witness box, Riley said Inspector Brunton and Sergeant Phillips had coerced, worn him down and tricked him into confessing. He told the court that Brunton had told him that the footprint in the garden had been proved to be his and that his fingerprints were all over the house. The detective would even described how he thought Riley had murdered the old lady, describing it so clearly that in his confused state he began to believe that it must be true. They then told Riley that traces of blood had been found on his clothes. Riley claimed that DS Phillips told him to make a statement and that things would be alright for him. After lunch, Brumpton returned with Riley's ring, saying that was the final clinching piece of evidence that marks of Mrs Smith's face were identical to the ring. He was again invited to make a statement, but still declined. Riley then said that after Brumpton had left, Phillips began a softer approach and finally persuaded him to confess. Riley never denied writing the statement, but he said the police officers had worn him down and duped him. Naturally, both Brumpton and Phillips gave a completely different account of events. Phillips swore on oath that between 4.10 and 5.40, he merely stood watching Riley, who said and did nothing, until Riley asked him what the legal definition of capital murder was. Riley then said, She was alive when I left her. I wanted some money. I can't remember anything. I was drunk. The judge, in summing up, told the jury, If you disregard this statement, if you do not think this is a confession, then the prosecution do not invite you to say all the remaining evidence is sufficient to convict this man of this very serious offence. Changes to the different categories of murder as a result of the 1957 Homicide Act meant that, because of the element of murder committed in the course of murders of theft, this was capital murder, and if convicted, capital punishment was inevitable. On Monday, December 12th, the jury, including two women, retired for just under two hours before declaring George Riley guilty of capital murder and Mr Justice Berry sentenced him to hang. The Court of Criminal Appeal, headed by Lord Chief Justice Parker in London, dismissed Riley's appeal on Monday, January 23rd in just 10 minutes, one of the shortest judgments ever in a murder case. Riley's solicitor, Anthony Hayes, agreed that the trial itself was impeccably fair and they had only appealed because they believed the Home Office would not look at a reprieve until the appeal had been dismissed. Up until Thursday, February the 2nd, the week before the scheduled date of execution, the case had received very little national coverage, until Louis Blom Cooper, lawyer and legal correspondent with The Observer, wrote an article which appeared in that weekend's paper. Titled Another Evans Case, it referenced the perceived, at the time, miscarriage of justice following the execution of Timothy Evans, for the murder of his wife at 10 Millington Place, Notting Hill, London. Serial killer John Christie was later executed for a number of other murders and it was believed he was guilty of the murder of Mrs Evans and her baby. Solicitor Hayes also wrote a five-page letter to Home Secretary Richard Buckler explaining why Riley should be spurred, the gist of which was that he had condemned himself already being condemned by his statement. No official reply was given until Tuesday, February the 7th two days before the scheduled date of execution at Shrewsbury Prison. Abolitionist Sidney Silverman MP put down a question in the House of Commons asking for an inquiry to see whether a miscarriage of justice had occurred, but it was ruled inadmissible. In the meantime, the national press got behind the story and read headlines about Riley's impending fate. A local petition had raised around 2,000 signatures but failed to impress the Home Secretary who made a statement in the House saying I have satisfied myself of the prisoner's guilt. In his book, Reprieve, A Study of a System, Fenton Bresler described the final visit to the condemned man by his father and three brothers. His mother was too ill to go. He noted that as they made their farewells, George's eldest brother, Edward, stayed back and asked George, did you do it or not? Looking him in the eye, Riley said, no, I didn't. Riley was also visited in the condemned cell by his girlfriend, Phyllis Rook, on the day before the execution. She found him in good spirits and told reports he was spending his last night on earth listening to the wireless. As the farewell meetings took place, a few yards away, the hangmen were silently making their preparations for the following morning. Though sleeps in Shrewsbury Jail tonight, or wakes as may be tied, a better lad, if things went right, than most that sleep outside. 
and naked to the hangman's noose, the morning clocks will ring, a net God made for other use than strangling in a string. Two days before the scheduled date of execution, the Governor of Shrewsbury Jail received word from the Home Office that there was no ground to reprieve and the law would take its course. As Riley spent the last night in his cell, prisoners in the jail staged what a local newspaper described as a horrifying demonstration against the execution. They whistled, shouted and screeched and kept up a constant chanting of Don't Hang George and Let Riley Go Free. The chanting was so loud it could be heard outside by neighbours, one of whom recorded the noise and offered the recording to news reporters who had gathered outside the prison. With no reprieve forthcoming, George Riley was hanged at 8 o'clock on Thursday the 9th of February 1961 by Eric Allen and Sam Plant. A small crowd of around 150 gathered outside, waiting silently for the fateful hour of 8 o'clock. There was a first execution there since Desmond Hooper was hanged in January 1954 for a brutal child murder. George Riley became the last of 10 men to be hanged inside the walls of Shrewsbury Prison. The case of George Riley remains controversial and views on whether his execution were justified are mixed. Fenton Bresler visited George Riley's family and said that after examining the evidence carefully, particularly the disputed confession, he came to the conclusion that Riley was guilty of murdering Mrs Smith. Bresler also defended the Home Secretary's refusal to grant a reprieve. There were no extenuating circumstances. This was not a first conviction, but was a dastardly crime what else could Mr Butler do? On the weekend after Riley's execution, and with his body now lying in an unmarked felon's grave inside the prison walls, his girlfriend gave an interview with a Sunday paper and revealed the contents of letters Riley had written to her from the death cell. In the most poignant, written shortly after their farewell visit, Riley said, God, the end is so close now, I wish I could have touched you, held you and told you that I love you. They had been prevented from making physical contact by the reinforced glass partition window in the small visiting room. The letter ended with Riley telling her to find a nice bloke with a steady job and settle down. I know what I've always wanted, he wrote, a nice wife and a couple of kids, a good home and a good job. But things never seem to work out the way you want them to be. Whether or not George Riley murdered Mrs Smith is still debated today. The fact remains, Riley's statements reveal facts that no police officer could have known. That Adeline Smith kept money upstairs, that she was alive when Riley left, and that she was shouting at him. Did Riley drink so much that he committed the murder without realising he had actually done it? Was there a second suspect? Why did the police not even bother to look beyond George Riley, who they actually had in custody barely two hours after the body was discovered? And did the police bully or force a statement out of him to make him sign his life away. What is true is that in 1964, Detective Superintendent William Brumpton was censured by a judge following the acquittal of a man on a capital murder charge, with the judge suggesting that the statement was very fortuitous for the man to confess without any coercing. HMP Shrewsbury, the Dana, was once dubbed the most overcrowded prison in England and Wales with a reputation for violence and suicide. A Category BC adult male prison, it was also one of the oldest in the UK before it was decommissioned in March 2013. Now open to the public and featured in several TV programmes, it is listed amongst the most haunted prisons in Britain. Sadly, very little remains of the execution suite and the gallows to give the visitor a feel for any of the atmosphere. The scaffold was removed decades ago and the wing remodelled so it's hard to see exactly where the trap doors and levers stood. Although to cash in on the tourist trade, efforts have been made to try to recreate a close facsimile. And today, as the case is still talked about, there are many in Shrewsbury who believe George Riley was an innocent man and they know the identity of the real killer. My name is Steve Fielding. Thank you for watching and listening to another episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. If you have enjoyed this video, please click like and if you don't already, can I ask you to please subscribe to my channel. There is no charge, it just helps you to keep up to date with new content as it is posted. Please check out my website www.stevefielding.com where you can find information on all my books 
and order copies of the three volume Hangman's Record series at a special discount price. My latest book, Tales from the Hangman's Record Volume 1, is now available from Amazon as a paperback and Kindle download. Also check out my podcast channel, Tales from the Hangman's Record and Mostly Murder. Finally, please use the comments below for your thoughts on this episode and for suggestions for further cases to be featured in the series. Thank you.